Goodbye, the show where we tell you about a thing and whether or not you should actually buy that thing. Today, we're reviewing Marvel's Spider-Man 2, as written by the gamer's editor-in-chief, Stacey Henley. Spider-Man 2's best quality is how extremely mindful it is of what came before. A lot of sequels take the approach of, this was popular last time, let's do more, or people didn't like this, so let's cut it. But Insomniac delves a little deeper. It thinks about what it's trying to say and confronts its earlier shortcomings. There are some gameplay iterations, some old favourites returning, and some technological advancements at work here but mostly, it feels like Spider-Man has grown up. In the first game, Peter was in frequent communication with the police force, and most of the missions were bookended by the faithful boys in blue keeping the city clean. That and the fact that Peter labelled low-level street drug deals his least favourite crime, plus the repair and use of police snooping tech, gave the game a very specific political outlook. Spider-Man 2 stops way, way short of calling the NYPD pigs, but most interactions Peter and Miles have with the emergency services is through the fire department. Spider-Cop, or any reference to helping the police, is gone. Crimes Peter and Miles interfere in are always violent or with clear victims, and in one side quest they even spot someone doing something illegal and take the view of, we should stop this before the cops arrive rather than the punitive option of leaving baddies webbed up ready for the throes of incarceration. This sense of maturity extends to the storytelling too. In the previous games, there were too many bosses thrown at you right at the end. While Miles' foes outside of the Tinkerer were light on both intrigue and relevance. They seem to exist simply because games like these need boss battles, and became set pieces intended to give you a breather from the story itself. In Spider-Man 2, everything weaves together beautifully, like the squirming tendrils of symbiote that slither across every inch of the game's second half, gameplay and narrative work together in ways the previous two games fell short on. Every boss battle is either a turning point or an ending point, featuring constant conversation between heroes and villains that feels relevant and powerful. Rather than empty air full of quips, these are opportunities to connect with characters on a deeper level than a health bar. Some, like Martin Lee, even integrate this storytelling into mechanics themselves. This approach might not be for everyone, it means every single boss has multiple stages, and because these battles are thematically linked, you don't get to pick between Miles and Peter at all throughout the main story, but other, more crowd-pleasing options wouldn't work as well. You can, however, choose between Miles and Peter freely in the breaks between missions, exploring an expanded New York at your leisure. I chose Miles almost every time. There are some missions where you can use either Miles or Peter, but since these are all combat based, I lent on Miles for his stealthy invisibility and unique electric abilities. Peter's abilities change as his relationship with the symbiote evolves, and that can make it difficult to track what attacks he has and when. He's the crunchier, more powerful fighter, but Miles is swift and better at takedowns, which suited what I wanted to do far more often. Peter's solo missions are mostly just riffs on the original game without too much else to them. Instead of science experiments for Dr. Octavius, he does them for Harry's charity. While he also works with Wraith, Yuri from the original game, in an excellent side story with a fantastic conclusion, you unlock these episodically so it's more of a main mission than a side adventure anyway. Miles, on the other hand, continues to explore Harlem's cultural heritage and provides the game with some well-needed soul. It feels like two games in one. First, a true sequel to Spider-Man where Peter battles the symbiote and Miles helps out. And second, Miles embracing what it means to be Spider-Man. And even though his own spin-off game and the two Spider-Verse movies deal with that exact theme, it still manages to feel new here. His connection to romantic interest Haley, a standout character, and his mother gives Miles' storyline a grounded heart that Peter's big bad alien rock claws at but only occasionally reaches. 
Much was made of the mean Peter personality seen in past trailers, which seemed more like a parody of Bully Maguire than a human psyche truly sinking into darkness. Unfortunately, the finished game feels similar, but there's far more to the symbiote than it making you angry. It's through everyone's reactions to Peter's changing identity, as well as the other places the symbiote storyline explores, that the narrative excels. You sometimes need to wait for a payoff around Peter's arc, but the game delivers in the end. Craven often feels superfluous, and then earns the best moment in the game. Most big budget games look gorgeous these days, so it's cheating to mention it, but combined with Insomniac's best in show photo modes, there will be some beautiful shots coming out of this game. Like these wonderful, wonderful shots. It's also something of a technical marvel, especially impressive considering this is the third full game, fourth if you include the remasters, Insomniac has released since Spider-Man in 2018. Fast travel is instant and lets you pick your marker right down to the alley you want to swing through, and you can switch characters on the fly too. There's some clever disguise here, the map zooms in and there's an animation of the first swing you can't control, while switching always happens when the other Spidey is lazing in a hammock or doing something else that kills a few seconds of loading time. But it remains remarkable. To do that in a map double the size that feels fresh and endless while never overwhelming is genius. As far as the Spideys fighting alongside each other in regular out of mission combat though, a rarely used gimmick that doesn't need to be there. Of course, a decent chunk of any Spider-Man game is punching bad guys. And Spider-Man 2 is very good at punching bad guys. While Peter's abilities remain in a flux, when he has access to symbiote attacks he can wreck anyone and anything. Gadgets are far more useful now too, and work in tandem. Initially, there's a tool that pulls enemies closer together, and it's mostly useful to create a group for an ability attack. But as you upgrade it, you can use it to slam nearby items like trash cans into several faces at once, or even pull enemies towards your grenades. The ability to put zip lines across battle arenas also means no more hopping from vantage point to vantage point to scout out an angle. You can make each fight your own. I do think it's weird that the instant you're spotted, enemies will call backup, but if they only suspect you, like if you distract them with webs, they don't bother and seem to be absolutely calm. Still, I like that it rewards you for taking the considered approach. The fact that you can disadvantage bases through stealth hacks and will remain hidden if you stealthily use items also makes combat side quests a little richer than the web first, ask questions later approach main missions often force you into. Spider-Man 2 feels like it's right in the center of Sony's blockbuster sequel design philosophy. Where Horizon Forbidden West did the same thing but bigger, The Last of Us Part 2 elevated itself technologically, narratively, and most importantly, ambitiously. Spider-Man 2 falls between these approaches. It has some of Horizon's safety, but with a slice of the elevation The Last of Us brought. Spider-Man 2 is the future of polished, competent, elevated sequels, and brings with it so many technical flourishes and a perfect execution of the formula that it stands in a class of its own. Like Miles' own motto, Spider-Man 2 can be itself and be greater. <laughs>